Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm Mary Ellen Carroll, and I'm here with Dr. Howard Rena, um, and we are in um, the Dream Machine, which is a reimagined uh, Airstream trailer um, by We Are Two, which is uh, Sarah Meltzer and Suchi Reddy. Um, and we are actually at the Parish Museum in Watermill. Um, so um, part of why we are here and why we're, what we're actually doing is um, transmitting um, over unused um, television frequencies. So UHF and VHF are now um, utilized by less than you know seven percent of the population so all of that real estate is now available and the FCC we have an experimental license from the FCC to be doing this with devices that have been developed by my colleagues at Rice University um, Dr. Edward Knightley the lead engineer has been uh, Ryan Guerra and so um, what we're looking at and what's here and how this is being transmitted is over a software defined radio. So we're wirelessly connecting to um, the parish, which would be uh, impossible with regular Wi Fi. And so this is um, what's, you know, basically the future. So just a few things uh, about Howard, Dr. Howard Rena. So he's a professor, vice chair, Department of Neurosurgery, director of the Neurosurgery Residency Program, director of endovascular neurosurgery at NYU, uh, Brooklyn-born, yes. uh, educated uh, initial joint uh, Lee at Franklin and Marshall and University of Pennsylvania with a bioengineering degree, went to Temple for uh, med school, um, then to Cambridge, uh, has had numerous awards, fellowships. Um, one of the things that always strikes me in reading is about skull-based surgery, which we can talk about, and specializes in uh, cerebrovascular disorders of the brain and spinal cord, none of which do we want to have, but if <laughs> we do need the doctor, it's going to be um, Dr. Howard Rena. So thank you, and also a good friend. Um, so here we are, we're sitting in front of this advanced technology that we're treating really as a kind of material, right, to talk about how sort of retrofitting these spaces and I think one of the things I mean you hear about neurosurgeons and uh, that process of how, how did that become first of all the area that you wanted to specialize in oh neurosurgery yeah uh -huh. and then also the other areas that you yeah. are focused on specifically with sure yeah well, um, my original attraction to neurosurgery was after I read uh, an article uh, when I was about 12 or 13 years old uh, about uh, a neurosurgeon actually in New York City who was at NYU at the time. And uh, I read an article that um, he was sort of profiled in a, a series of articles uh, in a magazine. And I sort of uh, followed that whole series. And at that early age, I decided that this was something that I wanted to do. Ironically, by the time I was at Penn and doing my bioengineering, he became the head of neurosurgery mm -hmm. at the University of Pennsylvania. And he gave me my first summer job. And uh, I eventually wound up being trained by him. And now he's actually a close personal friend of mine. He's almost 80 years old mm -hmm. um, uh, and still practicing, but getting close to the end of his neurosurgical career. So that's what originally attracted me to neurosurgery. And I was very, very fortunate in being exposed to some very um, sort of pivotal figures in the area of neurosurgery that I work, which is this area of cerebrovascular neurosurgery, and I've managed to work and be trained by some very talented people. Uh, so translate that for everyone. As far as the area that I work yeah. in? or So I, I like to work um, within the vascular space, so the blood vessels. 
And the reason, um, very early on, I was exposed to an area that was just starting to develop uh, in neurosurgery. So traditionally, when you have a blood vessel problem in the brain or spinal cord, um, you have to go inside. And so uh, you have to make an incision on the head, a window in the bone, and go in and fix um, the blood vessel problem. It's a, if it's an abnormal collection of blood vessels, you have to remove it. If it's a weak area on a blood vessel, you have to um, repair it. Uh, and if there's a stroke, um, there was very little that we could do. And I would say about 25 years ago, a new area um, sort of started to emerge, which was using some of the techniques that the interventional cardiologists and um, interventional um, vascular radiologists were doing, where we would access the blood vessels with wires and catheters or plastic tubes and bring those up into the brain or into the blood vessels of the spinal cord and repair things from the inside out. And so sort of work inside the vascular space. And to me, that minimally invasive way of doing things through a needle stick in the groin was sort of part of that that, that whole idea that, you know, the, this revolution in surgery. Surgery started out as this maximally invasive type of um, field in medicine and now has become this minimally invasive. And even our open operations now, we've been pioneering this this type of surgery where we use um, very small openings when we have to physically go in. Say we use the eyelid um, as the incision mm. and make a small window in the bone uh, instead of the, the big um, sort of uh, opening uh, openings that we used to use. Uh, but still a lot more has been done with this minimally invasive space. And I thought that was sort of the 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 the, the sort of the area of neurosurgery and the, the sort of very exciting and sort of cutting edge there was a lot of device design involved and, um, and ways of injecting medications um, to achieve some of the same things that we used to achieve with open surgery. And so that's, that, for a long answer, that's, that's how it wound up there. Okay. How, um, I mean, how does one go from then, you know, being interested to that to then also then being in the surgery and cutting open your first skull and what that, I mean, of course you observe for many years before you're actually the doing. And then another thing in terms of the development of technologies that go into the body, right? So I'm thinking of like DeBakey and Cooley and when they used the, um, you know, coffee machine to, as a model for a pumping system for some of the early, early, early work that was being done on the heart-lung machine and the diversion of that. So, I mean, the brain is, is it's, it's a whole other universe, of course. So just talk a couple, a little bit about those two areas. Well, I mean, I think we, we all need a, a foundation to, to develop new technology on. And you, you, you only get so much in school. You get so much of the principles of engineering and the principles of physics. But then a lot of it has to do with sort of absorbing what you see around you. And so I do a lot of device design um, right now, particularly in the in intervascular space. And that involves um, seeing how things can um, work within sort of the constraints of the environment. So. You mentioned DeBakey and Cooley, and there's that wonderful museum down in Houston where they have all the, the different um, elements of what they needed to do. They needed a heart-lung, you know, sort of bypass machine. And so the logical thing was, you know, what variations on pumps and then mm. taking those variations and making the modifications to use them in a, in a medical setting. And it's not unlike what, you know, what we're trying to do, mm. um, which is to try to use some of these basic principles to come up with um, design. So uh, if, you know, if we treat uh, these weak parts on a blood vessel wall called an, an aneurysm, and an aneurysm when it ruptures has a very high um, mortality rate and, and patients that don't die can be um, seriously affected for the rest of their lives. Now traditionally, and the first aneurysm was operated on 70 years ago, um, you know, that operation has changed very little over that period of time. You make a window in the bone, you go in and you put a metal clip and you sort of pinch off the aneurysm. Well, about 25 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, a gentleman came up with the idea of trying to fill the aneurysm with tiny metal coils and then detaching those. Hmm. And well, that works if the aneurysm has a specific shape, but it doesn't work for some of these other types of aneurysms mm -hmm. that we see. 
So then we tried to come up with ways of keeping the coils in there when the shape of the aneurysm wasn't ideal. And so you could inflate a balloon. So you take a balloon, we all know what a balloon looks like when we see a little child walking around with a balloon. Well, if you inflate a balloon inside a blood vessel, like say when you're doing angioplasty, well, that balloon blocks the neck of the aneurysm and you can put coils around that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you let the balloon down, um, hopefully the coils will then stay in the aneurysm. So you've managed to pack the coils into the aneurysm. And then over the last sort of five to 10 years, we've been able to put in stents. Now a stent is basically a cylindrical device that um, is a mesh work or a mm -hmm. lattice work. And you can go through the sort of the, the openings in that, the cells mm -hmm. of the lattice um, into the aneurysm and that the stent itself will then hold the coils in. And that now has led itself into um, basically um, more dense types of stents, almost like the screen on your screen door. And what happens with that is that the cells, the inside of your blood vessels um, are lined with cells that are alive and those cells will grow over the stent or the this lattice work. And by growing over the stent, they'll ex essentially exclude the aneurysm hmm. over time. Huh. So you'll grow a new vessel from within. Wow. And so, but that works in a straight segment or a cylindrical segment. So one of our devices now is a device that actually can be put up in a, a bifurcation, an area where blood vessels split. Mm -hmm. and so you have to come up with a solution how to go into one limb of the bifurcation and then pull down and go into the other limb and deliver mm -hmm. your device. And so um, it just really depends on what you're exposed to out there and then sort of absorbing what you see um, in the world around you. And ironically, or not necessarily ironically, is that a lot of things come from nature. You see things, you know, in, in, the, in the real world, yeah. um, and that have, you know, really profound effect on how you come up with your solutions. In fact, when I talk with patients about their aneurysm um, and how the vessels um, grow and how aneurysms and where they grow, the, the natural um, example is a tree. I mean, trees grow um, and uh, trees grow and basically what they do is where the branches come off, that's the same way your blood vessels develop. And it's an excellent way of describing that um, to patients. And so um, th there's a lot of solutions that also come from the natural world. And what about the, the made world and, and the design world? So when I, there were a couple things that in hearing you talk about this one, the, the screen, um, the networks, right? So networks and mesh networks, right? So one of the things with you know, this technology and, and the radio frequencies is that mesh is a way of creating, you know, it's basically you're putting all of these Wi-Fi devices that um, link together and they create a sort of, it's called a mesh network. And so it provides a blanketed coverage, not particularly, you know, it can be broadband, but it can be much slower. but there's you know there's other ways of like seeing something as you said like the nature and the tree to come up with some kind of solution to some uh you know existing problem right that you wouldn't think about of like oh my god look that's how that system is functioning maybe this can be do you have any you know are there any examples of that that you've utilized from other well, disciplines I'll, yeah that, well, well i'll give you that's you know you yeah. mentioned other disciplines and that's really a great um you know way to explore you know some of these yeah. ideas that you're talking about so in medicine we tend to focus on our area yeah. and, and that's how you become very good at treating patients and problems is by focusing on these you know very you know very small areas of medicine and just doing and treating these complex patients the same way um, over and over again. Mm -hmm. You learn more about the disease and you learn how to get better outcomes, mm -hmm. essentially. But in a way, it limits your, your, your ability to come up with novel ways to have solutions uh, for problems. And I'll give you a great example on, on, on some projects that I've worked on. Um, and one is an ongoing problem. So um, I have a patient um, who uh, had a head and neck cancer. And because um, I fixed blood vessels, he had a problem with a blood vessel in his neck. And um, because he was radiated for this head and neck cancer. And so I wound up having to put a stent in the blood vessel in his neck that was getting narrow. But because of the radiation, he was also having a problem with his airway and his ability to breathe. 
and he needed a tracheotomy performed. And when I met him, I said to him, I said, well, how come they don't put a stent in the airway? And he said, well, I don't know. You should talk to my ear, nose, and throat doctor, in which he introduced me to his ear, nose, and throat doctor, who's a very, very talented gentleman, uh, Dr. Robert Ward. And we met and we discussed, and it turns out, well, there are stents for the airway, but they're about, their design is about 20, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And no one has really approached the problem from the modern way of looking at devices that go inside um, spaces. And the interesting thing is, well, if you think about it, uh, uh, a blood vessel is a cylindrical tube and the airway is a cylindrical tube. And a lot of the, you know, uh, organs in our body have cylindrical spaces. And so if we have solutions that we can use in the intravascular space, there's really no reason that we can't modify them to use them in the, the airway. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did is we took some devices that we were you know, de developing for the vascular space and modified them for the airway. And, and then with the knowledge from the ear, nose and throat people, um, particularly Dr. Ward, we were able to um, use those um, sort of criteria, mm -hmm. the e e ENT criteria, and come up with a device that had the sort of the technology background, one foot in the intravascular mm -hmm. space, um, but a functional space um, in, the, in the airway. And we, we have now a, a prototype device that we're working with the FDA right. to um, go and work um, and do the first human patients with this device. This device sits um, in the airway below the vocal cords, but um, in people that have either radiation damage or injury to the vocal cords, the vocal cords will become opposed. And if they're opposed, then people can't pass air through there and they'll need a trach. Uh, but if we put our device in, the device sits below the vocal cords, um, opens them so that they can breathe. They don't need the trach. And because it doesn't touch the vocal cords, it allows them to phonate. Wow. And so that's an, an, uh, a way of bringing two disciplines together yeah. and everybody bringing something else to the table. And that actually works quite well um, because, you know, you'll bring somebody into the room and you'll say, well, I want to do this, this, and this. And, and you'll say, well, I can't do this because of this problem. Whereas the guy coming from the other field will say, well, why not? Yeah. You know, they, they're, they're not bound um, by the rules that you think you're bound by. Mm -hmm. And so they just point that out um, to you and you and you do the same with them. And so that's an exciting um, way to develop and design mm -hmm. um, physical devices. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you see? I, so one of the things that we've been talking about is also um, you know, real estate and open access. And like, so for instance, you know, this, what is sitting behind us is actually, um, you know, a kind of redrawn map of all the radio frequencies. And the one thing is that people understand, you know, the physical layer of things, right? Being on the ground and that this piece of property is for sale. And we started out yesterday and talking um, with this woman, Katie Baldwin, who, um, has Am Amber Waves Farm, which I want to introduce Paul with Anne about that. The, um, but with that, then when you go into these other spaces that are invisible, like inside the brain and understanding and who really, you know, who are the, you know, really privileged people that do have that knowledge base, we know that, you know, now there's this unused frequency, which is this blank area, which when you see it in relation to everything else, you know, this is unoccupied right now. So in seeing, you know, your stroke patients and other patients that undergo these procedures, what actually then happens with in that space and can things certain activities or functions shift to some other so so let, let's get yeah. there yeah. Um, but let's <laughs> let's first talk about waves yeah and and talk about um imaging yes of the brain and so you know when a patient comes into the emergency room now and um, they have some type of neurological problem or even a non-neurological problem they'll often get a cat scan and um if they after that they may even get an mri scan mm -hmm. But you, you, what you forget, um, or you may not even know, is that when I started, and I don't consider myself particularly old, when I started my training, those things were actually brand new. Yeah. 
you know, MRI scanning, even though uh, it was sort of the technology grew out of research that was being done in the 70s and, and 80s, uh, out of the music industry, EMI was actually the company that um, financed the research um, that led to MRI uh, imaging. I didn't that. Why yeah. was that? Um, it, just because, again, we're getting into waves yeah. and, and imaging, but but that, th this technology is, is relatively new. So the first CAT scanners appeared on the scene in the early to mid 80s. Um, by the time I started my training, um, we had CAT scanning, but the quality of the images wasn't great. Mm. Uh, as a as a undergraduate student, I actually volunteered and was paid to be a, a contrast. Uh, um, sort of, uh, I don't want to say guinea pig, but uh, a, a subject that got the new contrast agents for mm. MRI imaging. Mm. That's how new these technologies are. And so CAT scanning involves uh, taking a, a block of tissue and exposing it to multiple images of the radiation. And then a computer program reconstructs the tissue. And in, in the beginning, those were done on a sort of a pixelated basis, almost mm. like the early photographic images and the early digital images. Remember mm -hmm. when you get a digital camera now, it has so many pixels yeah. and, that in, and the more pixels you have, the, the higher the quality. So with, with CAT scanning in the be beginning, you had fewer pixels. Now the, the imaging is much more um, rapid. You have many more image slices that are obtained with lower radiation doses and you get very, very clear images now of tissue. MRI, however, functions on a whole different um, way, whereas CT scanning relies on x-ray, which is ionizing radiation, MRI imaging uh, uses um, basically uh, radiation, mm -hmm. um, the, the, but not like ionizing radiation, but the radiation that is given off uh, by tissues when they're exposed to a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So if you take, um, if you take a, a block of tissue, the, in particular the hydrogen ions, if you take a block of tissue, and tissue has a lot of water in it, your bodies, our bodies have a lot of water in them, the hydrogen ions are all spinning in different directions in, in our cells, in our atoms. And if you take those individuals and you put them in a very, very high electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. suddenly all those uh, hydrogen uh, atoms, uh, which were spinning in random orbits, suddenly align in the frequency mm -hmm. of the magnet. When the magnet is turned off, and that's that banging sound you hear if you've ever had the opportunity to be in an MRI no, scan, but, um, but some people complain about the sound, but that's those magnets being turned on and on, off. But when you turn off the magnets, they go back to their random spins. And when they do that, they give off a signal, mm -hmm. and that signal is picked up by the equipment that analyzes it and creates a, an image from that. Now we never had those kinds of images. We knew from the, you know, for centuries, the anatomical basis of the brain, what we could see. Mm -hmm. But now we can actually see cellular layers of the brain. And we can now map fiber tracks, we can map the vasculature, and we can see how all these different things interact to a much more detailed understanding of the anatomy, the neuroanatomy okay. of the brain. So that that's sort of, one aspect of it. The, the other thing that we, you know, we were sort of leading into was the signals. The, the brain is an electrical organ. And so cells fire their action potentials and signals are transmitted along from the cell bodies to axons. Mm -hmm. And it goes down to your spinal cord and gets to your muscles and, and gets to glands and, and interacts with the whole way that the body works. So this, this electrical system of the brain um, has patterns and waves. So the most one that we're most familiar with is the EEG wave. So patients, if you put sort of leads on their head, you can see the, the brain activity. And when people are having seizures, we see areas of abnormal activity. Well, on a even finer level, there are parts of the brain that um, control um, our movement. So mm -hmm. that people that have Parkinson's disease have a disruption of a certain part of the brain. Well, if you pass electrodes into those areas that are disrupted and introduce a signal, you can actually reduce or eliminate their tremor. And that's mm. now done with something that we call deep brain stimulation. Mm. And they get hooked up to a, a pacemaker-like device. So we're just now, really in the last few years, combining this knowledge with now this new imaging 
anatomical type of knowledge, so the maps. Yeah. So the maps are, are important, but understanding the signals now has become very important, and then how to modify those signals. Hmm. And, you know, you can look to the future, and what's going to happen in the future? Well, there are already groups that are working on individuals that have had strokes and putting stimulators over parts of the brain hmm. to try to make other parts of the brain hmm. pick up the... Right the work that these areas that have been damaged by stroke formerly um, had. And even outside the brain, you can build sort of exoskeleton now type devices for stroke um, patients and victims uh, so that you can try to con control their limbs externally mm. um, so with these sort of exoskeleton types of suits. Mm. Oh. That was a long-winded answer. No, no, so no. That was a good A lot of exciting a... things in there. Um, so preemptively right so dna testing like now right so i mean my understanding and talking to some other people that are doing work oncologists is you know that basically everybody has these cancer genes right and it's just a matter of them um you know being activated in some way or whatever your whatever your dna makeup is that's going to determine if you're going to have you know breast cancer or, or some you know something that would impact the brain so you'd have an aneurysm and so where's the point of where because you're further down the yeah we're not we're not completely there yet yeah. but you but definitely things are uh definitely things are heading in that general direction so only in the last few years have we sequenced the human genome yeah. now um, we're trying to understand where the different genes um, and the different functions for those genes and how they interact mm -hmm. and so it's it, you can't look at a single gene gene usually in isolation mm -hmm. so it, genes code for the production of a protein the protein has an effect on this location or this tissue but you're right, there are genes that um, they code for everything in your body. They, not only your physical appearance and how your, what diseases you may be exposed to, but also the natural corrective mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So just like there may be genes that promote the unregulated growth of what we would call a cancer, there are also tumor suppressor genes that um, in some individuals suppress um, the function of uh, cancer. Um, but there's a great opportunity to learn from individuals that have um, certain types of diseases because if you can see where the abnormality is when you compare them to the rest of, say, the population, then you might be able to develop target-specific corrections. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that, um, uh, we may be on the, on the sort of the brink of a revolution in medicine, and that's what a lot of people are um, planning for. So if you talk with, say, a gentleman like a Craig Ventner, who um, sequenced the human genome or was involved with that, yeah. uh, you know, he probably sees a, a time in the not so near future where you would come in, your genetic code would be analyzed, and you might be able to identify these problem areas before um, you had um, a particular disease. Mm -hmm. Or once your disease, you know, began to express itself, maybe you could tailor um, a treatment regimen uh, for that. And so it's certainly that um, molecular medicine, as it's referred to now in um, the universities and the medical schools, uh, is an area that we see uh, major growth in the next you know, decade or so. And also, I'm sure, nanotechnologies too coming into... Well, uh, yeah. well again, I mean, you, you, you can control things. I mean, so the, the fascinating thing, and they've, they've already done this, I think, on a certain level, is they've made those nano propellers, those self sort of propelling, uh, so those self sort of perpetual motion machines on a nanotechnology uh, basis because they can they generate their own energy source sources and they can use that using mitochondria as an energy source and sort of things that they've done on the cellular level. So I think we will see things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure right now I'm in the sort of the, the macular side of things, yeah. the, the big sort of, you know, if you think of blood vessels, they're big compared to things that are being done on the sort of nano level, but certainly that that may happen. Hmm. I mean, we, we've had some forays uh, into that. I did do uh, and was involved with some work a few years ago where we started opening up the blood brain barrier through our catheter technique so that we could introduce um, uh, brain tumor uh, types of medications to see if we could get more drug 
uh, to help some of these people. And those techniques um, were successful and, and people are using some of those techniques now, but our limitation are the drugs that we have. We don't really have the right drugs to, to cure the diseases. So we have the ways of delivering the drugs, but not really the, the actual um, pharmaceuticals to do mm. what we want. And that, that's gonna come with this molecular medicine. Mm. So, I mean, it's not too dissimilar of like how, why we're here and why I want you know, you to be a part of this. I mean, first of all, because I think the work is so important, but you know, this process of the pipeline and how far it extends and who is underserved or under-resourced is something that, um, you know, is really now it's a it's a fundamental part of how we all live and work and and what can actually be done to it. And so, you know, I think too this goes hand in hand with the question of policies and what you end up seeing, um, you know, on the federal level, right, in terms of keeping this, um, you know, as a piece of real estate in some way open. So, I mean, you know, and that's what made it possible, you know, for the artists in the 60s and 70s, and even certainly for a place like the parish to exist, um, was that there was an abundance of space that was um, underutilized in certain areas. So you have Marfa, Texas and other, but creating those, those structures and those sort of catalytic moments that make visible right these places and what the possibilities are and then how things evolve well, from there yeah well i mean I, I think you bring up a bunch of excellent points well first of all uh we're in an area now uh which um you know has is you know an extremely desirable area it's very um the real estate is uh, is has great uh, uh cost and, and value uh, but 40 years ago, it was an area where artists could come and they could buy property. I think Jackson Pollock bought his house out here for $5,000 or what, whatever it was at the time. But you had a lot of artists that mm -hmm. came out here. They were able to create these salons, so to speak, where different individuals could interact. And they, they basically changed um, contemporary art mm. and in a lot of ways they probably wouldn't be able to do it right now because they probably couldn't afford to get into this area yeah. which is the sort of the ultimate oh, irony they yeah. came out here these uh, these areas became um quite productive impacted the you know the the history of contemporary art uh but now they've been shut out and yeah. so if you look at that and sort of make the analogy to these public waves and the public access to this information or any information uh, that by limiting these things um, or charging money for them, um, you prevent what would happen naturally. Yeah. Um, and, and the salon, I like this word salon, because um, you know, if, if you read about the history of science, there were great salons in Vienna at the turn of the century where artists and physicians and and wealthy people came together um, and changed the, the way we do a lot of uh, different things. And so these salons that grow up, and, and you could even talk about me working with people outside of my own discipline as you know, a type of salon yeah. or my relationship with you, um, because all of these things feed in and change us mm -hmm. and change how we see the world and, and have impacts uh, or impact the way that um, we may push our respective fields forward. And so, very importantly, by protecting this type of public airspace, um, I think we'll allow these sort of public salons of people that want to work in this space uh, to develop. And as soon as you limit its access, either financially or, you know, let the larger companies get involved, you, you you limit the what could what potentially could grow from that. Yeah, well, that's what's that's important. Yeah. Poten the potential, and I think also a kind of um, you know vigilance about maintaining um, a sort of curiosity and questioning and how things can evolve in some way, right? Um, 
just one final thing. What else yeah. are you working on now? And and I know you talked about the bike helmet. Can you? Yeah, no. So we, we have a bunch of different projects. I'll tell you about the bike helmet. But before that, I'll tell you about another um, uh, project that we're working on that we have some very interesting funding for. And that is, um, I met a gentleman a few years ago. His name is Sandy Hecht. And uh, Sandy was a uh, resident in surgery when I met him. And so he was a young doctor learning to become a surgeon, but had a, a small company that built surgical instruments at the time. At the time, So he's uh, interested in design, interested in problem solving. And of course, had a slight entrepreneurial side as well. But um, I think what usually attracts people is an interest in design and problem solving. And um, Sandy approached me because he wanted to work in my lab. My lab is a, a virtual lab. It's, it, it goes on in my head. I don't have a physical <laughs> space. And so I said, well, we could certainly work together, but, That's you know, appropriate. Uh, but uh, I don't have a, a lab where, you know, I'm running, you know, gels or, yeah. you know, doing DNA analysis. But we, I, we do design work and things like that. And Sandy had an idea where we would um, pick up signals, electrical signals put out um, by your periauricular muscles. So the muscles around your ears, um, you know, going back to our um, evolutionary uh, predecessors, um, most um, mammals can move their ears. And some humans retain that ability, but not, not all of us. But, if you, but we all can, by thinking about contracting these muscles, give off a signal. And so we created a, a headset that picked up on these um, signals, a headset that um, had electrodes, that um, had a Bluetooth capability, and it was designed so that um, quadriplegics could operate a wheelchair. Wow. And so we actually built a device, and uh, we, have, we have been able to control a wheelchair, and now we're interfacing it with computers so that a quadriplegic or someone that's had a stroke can operate um, a computer, work drop-down menus, send emails. Uh, we we had some Google Glass, and um, Sergey Brin actually tried on our device uh, for a period of time. But now we've actually been talking with uh, Samsung. But we applied for um, because this we did this at, through a, a company um, as a way to get funding. So the National Institutes of Health um, only funds about six percent of their grant applications. Well, there's a whole um, pot of money that's available for um, startup companies. And those types of grants um, call, are called SPIR Rather grants. STT, yeah. yeah, and so these grants we applied for, and we actually were awarded National Science um, Foundation uh, money to develop this device. And then the Air Force kicked in some money. And so we've actually got several years of money to develop this technology. So that this this headset, and we, we, we work, it's under the name, we call it the company Reach Bionics, um, has had some early success. And we've been doing some trials at USC in their rehab center, nice. um, training people that are injured to use the device yeah. um, to um, you know operate devices and to work um, uh, and do various tasks on computers with it. So that's one project. And again, very much outside of my area of expertise for the most part. The other um, area that is a little bit closer, and it's not stent design or tracheal stent design, is this idea of a helmet. And um, for a while, um, I've been thinking about different types of helmets, as have uh, many people. And the traditional helmets that are used in most activities, so an activity helmet, a sporting helmet, a bike helmet, a football helmet, a hockey helmet, they tend to have a, a hard shell and then a, a relatively, um, stiffer um, cushion underneath them. And, and um, I was introduced to a, um, a biologist or a zoologist at Oxford who is an expert on uh, silk, spider silk and silkworm silk. And silk is a fascinating substance because on a certain level, it's stronger than steel in its tensile capabilities, but it can be extruded, it can be woven, you can do different things with it. And we came up with a, a structure so to speak, that can absorb the force of, uh, of an impact, not only in a direct manner. So when we think about um, impact, we often think about the direct manner. So you have a helmet and you strike another object and there's a direct force, but really the force that does the most damage, and we know this from our 
neurosurgery and imaging and all the patients that we've seen over the years is that there's a rotational force. And that rotational force is what causes the damage right. because axons resist that kind of rotational injury and, and are torn that way. And that's called diffuse axonal injury. And that leads to a lot of, um, of the problems that individuals have um, in, in head injury. Uh, and so we, we've come up with a, a very relatively um, new way of absorbing both direct force and rotational forces. And we're building a prototype in Oxford right now. This is funded by um, one of my former patients who had a head, head injury that I took care of, who made a fantastic and complete recovery, um, cre created a foundation. Uh, and that foundation has supports uh, this research. Wow. And so we're actually building the prototype right now in Oxford. Um, we've already tested the material and the material um, did extremely well in the, in the testing. So now we build the sort of prototype helmet. Mm. So we'll see where that goes. But uh, that's kind of it. So the, the, the blood vessel surgeon has a, a few things outside of his area, uh, but no. he likes to keep himself busy with <laughs> So, Howard, thank you. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we'll, um, again, I think, you know, networks looking at, you know, these other kinds of materials, I think, yeah. you know, ending with the silk being used. It's, and it's how the salon. I just it. want to be part of your salon. You're, you are. <laughs> and we are here um, in, the, in the dream machine. So, I love thanks, it. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks.